Prince Caspian, the return to Narnia, the second of the Chronicles published in 1951. My approach to the Chronicles uh, has been alluded to in the introduction uh, that Dr. De Lorenzo gave. Um, I approach the Chronicles of Narnia um, through the lens of the seven heavens. I think that the seven Chronicles were constructed by C.S. Lewis very deliberately, very consciously, but secretly out of the imagery of the seven heavens of the medieval cosmos. Uh, and that's what my book, Planet Narnia, is all about. Uh, let us just quickly remind ourselves what the seven heavens are before we um, focus in on Prince Caspian. These are the seven heavens. Earth, according to the pre-Copernican cosmological arrangement, was static and central, and it was surrounded by seven crystalline spheres, each with its own planet, and each planet with its own set of influences and attributes that it would shed upon the Earth, upon uh, people and events, and even the metals in Earth's crust. So here they are, going up from the Earth. They are the, the Moon's sphere, that of Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These are the seven planets that were known about before the invention of the telescope. And of course, it is from these seven planets that we take the names of the days of the week. Uh, today is Tuesday, isn't it? Um, the day of Mars, Mates in Spanish, or Mardi in French. This is probably the reason I asked to speak about Prince Caspian. Um, we were talking, <laughs> Lenny and I, about why, why I'd ask to speak about Prince Caspian, not about my favorite Narnia chronicle, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which Peter Skakel has the, the privilege of speaking about. It's probably because Tuesday, the day of Mars, is connected, as I believe, to Prince Caspian. So these are the seven heavens, the seven planets, and this is what C.S. Lewis said about them. The characters of the planets seem to me to have a permanent value as spiritual symbols, which is especially worthwhile in our own generation. Of Saturn, we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of Jove, Jupiter? Now, this is no small claim. Lewis is saying here that the, the, the seven heavens are not just an antiquarian curiosity fit for superstitious medieval type people, but they have a permanent value in the human imagination. Indeed, they are especially valuable, he says, in his own generation. Now, why would he say that? Because his own generation was the generation that went through the First World War. That is why he adds, of Saturn, we know more than enough. Because Saturn was symbolically associated with death. And three quarters of a million British servicemen were killed during the First World War. Lewis himself was very nearly one of them, as I will mention in a moment. But Saturn was not the only or even the best way of interpreting reality, according to those with a medieval mindset. There were six other ways of interpreting reality. And the best of them uh, was to be found in the symbolism of Jove, Jupiter. Here is a, an illustration from an edition of the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy is perhaps the, the greatest poem of the Middle Ages. And of course, as you know, in the Paradiso, the third canticle of the, of the Divine Comedy, the pilgrim mounts up through the seven heavens in his ascent to God's throne. And here are the seven planetary characters depicted in the order of the days of the week. So here on the left, we have the sun in his burning fiery chariot. And then going across, we have the moon for Monday, Mars for Tuesday, Mercury for Wednesday, Jupiter for Thursday, Venus for Friday, and Saturn for Saturn day. But I want to focus in on Mars, Martes, for Tuesday. You see him there with his helmet and his chain mail. And we all know that Mars is the god of war. Uh, I played for you the movement from Holst's Planet Suite, Mars the bringer of war, as you were coming in. We'll talk about that a little bit too in a moment. It's my belief that Mars provides Lewis with his spiritual symbol, his imaginative blueprint, which governs the way that he writes the second chronicle of Narnia, Prince Caspian. And if we want to understand the message of Prince Caspian, I think we need to understand the martial symbolism that goes to make it up. 
If you know Lewis's book, uh, An Experiment in Criticism, he says there that every work of literary art can be analyzed under two heads, both as something made, a poema, a work of poetic skill, and as something said, a logos, a work with a message. And a lot of people jump to the logos, to the message. They want to know, what's the point of this book? What's Lewis saying? What does it mean? Without, first of all, paying due attention to the way that it has been constructed. So what I want to do in this talk is, is first of all, address the way Lewis constructed Prince Caspian out of martial symbolism, and then we will look at what it says, what messages we might take out of it for our spiritual journey through Lent. But in order to, to get into that, uh, I, I just want to lay out three basic principles, basic building blocks that will uh, be of use to us as we proceed. And the first of them has to do with this verse from uh, the letter to the Colossians. An odd place to start, you might say. For all things were created through Christ and for Christ, and in Christ all things hold together. I put this up because Lewis was interested in this verse. He was sufficiently interested in it to paraphrase it in one of his books. He paraphrases it as, Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion, whereby the universe holds together. Now, Lewis once said that the whole Narnia series was about Christ. The whole Narnia series, he said, was about Christ. And when we hear Lewis say something like that, we immediately think of Aslan, the Christ character, who does Christ-like things, who dies for Edmund, who brings Narnia to birth in Magician's Nephew, who judges Narnia in the last battle. The Christological parallels in those three Narnia chronicles are, are very clear and obvious. You can't miss them. It's less immediately clear how Aslan depicts elements of Christ's life and ministry in the other four Narnia chronicles. But if we think of Christology more in this sense, in this cosmic sense of the, of the Christ who holds all things in being, the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together, then I think we may be getting closer to Lewis's meaning when he says that the whole Narnia series is about Christ. We shouldn't just be looking for hard and fast one-to-one -one parallels, allegorical parallels, so to speak, between what Aslan does and what Jesus does in the Bible, we should be thinking more holistically, more cosmically. So that's the first background building block, as it were. Do, do take seats, by the way. There are plenty in the middle here. If people could move up, perhaps, um, that would make it easier for you to get to seats so you don't have to stand. So that's the, the first building block, a kind of theological thing to have in our minds. Think of the cosmic Christ when you think of Narnia. Don't just think of Aslan as a Jesus figure. Ask yourself, how would Lewis go about depicting this kind of Christological vision? A vision of Christ woven into all things, not just into the Christ figure. That would be a much harder thing to put into a story, but it would be equally part of the, of the biblical vision. Secondly, let's have a, a literary uh, building block in, in, in our minds. L Lewis wrote an essay on stories where he says this, to be stories at all, stories must be series of events, but it must be understood that this series, the plot as we call it, is only really a net whereby to catch something else. The real theme may be, and perhaps usually is, something that has no sequence in it, something other than a process and much more like a state or a quality. Now, this, I think, is relevant to what he's up to in Narnia. He once told a friend of his, George Sayer, that he was interested in the atmosphere of each of the Narnia chronicles. He wanted this qualitative tone or flavor, which was, yes, in part communicated by the plot, by the sequence of events, but wasn't reducible to it. There's a sort of epiphenomenal quality to a well-told tale. That's why we go and reread our favorite stories many times in the course of our life. It was, if it was just the plot that we were interested in, we probably wouldn't read a story more than once because we, we know what happens. Why would you want to read it again unless you had forgotten what happened? But with your favorite novels, you reread them many times. 
take a great novel like Pride and Prejudice. You, you will read that many times in the course of your life, not because you've forgotten that Elizabeth Bennet marries Mr. Darcy. I'm sorry if that's a spoiler for anybody. Uh, <laughs> you reread Pride and Prejudice because you like the Austin world. You like the, what you might call the ostentatious flavor of the Austin world. But with a lesser kind of novel, like a, a typical whodunit murder mystery, like your, your typical Agatha Christie novel, where there's not much more than a clever plot, you tend not to reread Agatha Christie unless you have forgotten who did the murder, because Agatha Christie doesn't have much in the way of atmospherics. So keep this in mind, too, as you approach Narnia. What's the general flavor of, the, of each chronicle? What's the general tone distinct from the, the particular happenings of the plot? And our third background point um, is this, transferred classicism. This is a term that Lewis coined when he was writing a review of the Oxford Book of Christian Verse, where he says that Christian writers in the Middle Ages and indeed into the, into the Renaissance and the early modern period would often reach back into the classical past, into the myths of ancient Greece and Rome, and they would find there all sorts of classical deities, Zeus, Jupiter, Apollo, Venus, whoever it may be, and they would transfer those classical characters into their Christian art, their Christian literature of the Middle Ages. And Lewis says that God, that is to say the Christian God, will often appear in medieval and Renaissance literature but, bit, but disguised incognito, he says, masked behind a veil of superficially pagan characteristics, dressed up as Zeus or Apollo or Venus or whoever it may be. But he adds, everybody is in the secret. Everybody knows that this is just a literary technique. This is the, the means, Lewis says, by which Christian writers can write literature which is, which is religious without being devotional. You're just finding useful ways of talking about spiritual realities through pagan gods and goddesses. That's transferred classicism. It's baptizing classical mythology and turning it to Christian effect. In a way, it's similar to what we find St. Paul doing uh, in the book of Acts. You remember, here he is, St. Paul preaching to the men of Athens on the Areopagus. You can see there the, the Parthenon in the top left-hand corner. And, and what does St. Paul say to the men of Athens? He says this, God is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And who is St. Paul quoting here? He's not quoting... The, the Hebrew scriptures, he's quoting two Greek poems about Zeus. One by Epimenides, one by Aratus, and the original said, in Zeus we live and move and have our being, for we are indeed Zeus's offspring. Now, of course, St. Paul isn't encouraging the men of Athens to worship Zeus. He's just using their knowledge, their very incomplete knowledge of the divine nature and using it as a kind of springboard into his presentation of the gospel. He's saying, as it were, you're right that we live and move and have our being in God. You're right that we're God's offspring, but you're wrong in calling him Zeus. He is, in fact, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a kind of transferred classicism, as it were. So there's a scriptural precedent for what these uh, medieval and Renaissance authors were doing. And I think that Lewis, in his own way, in his own time, adopts this technique himself, very interestingly, in the Chronicles of Narnia. So those are our three background points. Now, just one other preliminary provisional thing before we get to Prince Caspian, and that is a, a very quick trot through Lewis's life um, and his interest in martial symbolism before we come on to Prince Caspian itself. When Lewis was only about four or five years old, according to Walter Hooper, he wrote a story, an incomplete story, entitled To Mars and Back. Uh, we know about this. It, it exists in, in two pages of Lewis's immature handwriting. Uh, 
Um, it's published in, in, in the book, uh, C.S. Lewis, Images of His World, uh, first edition, if you want to read it. Um, and that shows us Lewis's very early interest in things martial. It continued. Uh, if you look at Lewis's early poetry, um, uh, there's a lot to do with knights and their steeds. The chivalric ideal was evidently growing upon Lewis from an early age, and when he was about 16 or 17, he encountered Chaucer's Knight's Tale. And here's a page of notes that I found in Lewis's handwriting. This is from Lewis's complete Chaucer. This is notes that he made in the end leaves of, of his volume of Chaucer. And he's saying there, you see the Knight's Tale right at the top? We don't have time to dissect this, uh, these astrological symbols in the left-hand column, but I just put, put this up to, to inform you, if you're, if you're not already aware, that Lewis loved all things knightly from an early age. And indeed, he says about Chaucer's Knight's Tale that one of the clever things that Chaucer did in that story was that he, he didn't just put the, the planetary characters into the story as actors in the drama. No, he... he he, in addition, wove the appropriate influences, the appropriate planetary influences into the plot of the knight's tale. He says that in the discarded image. And by that he means, amongst other things, I think, that the climax of the knight's tale happens on a Tuesday, the day of Mars. How appropriate for a story about knights. Shortly after he encountered uh, Chaucer's Knight's Tale, Lewis himself became a modern version of a knight. Here he is at 19. It was on his 19th birthday that he arrived in the trenches of France, having been given a commission as a second lieutenant in the British Army. He served for about six months. Uh, here is the only photograph of Lewis in uniform. Uh, this was only discovered a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the close-up of second lieutenant, second lieutenant, as you would say, second lieutenant Lewis. And Lewis described this uh, wartime service as an odious necessity in his autobiography. Necessity is an interesting term for him to use there. Um, not long after his wartime experience, he, he wrote a poem called The Planets, in which he said that Mars was cold and strong, necessity's sun. Lewis's first publication, uh, his first fiction publication, not including The Pilgrim's Regress, which I count as autobiography more than fiction, um, was Out of the Silent Planet, 1938. This was the first volume in his Cosmic Trilogy. And how interesting that it's set on Mars. That uh, incomplete story that Lewis wrote when he was about six to Mars and back finally achieved public form in Out of the Silent Planet uh, when Lewis was uh, aged 40. In Out of the Silent Planet, Lewis names Mars Malacandra and locates most of the story there. And the planet is not just the setting for the story, but the martial spirit is also part and parcel of, of the drama. Following Ransom's arrival on Malacandra, every incident and image is designed to contribute to and, and to communicate this martial spirit. As, as he wrote to someone, he said, what's the excuse for locating one's story on Mars unless Martianity is through and through used emotionally and atmospherically as well as logically? There's no point in, in, in transferring to Mars a story which could equally as well have been set in the Bronx, he says. You've got, to have an, you've got to have a reason for setting it on Mars. All the martial qualities need to contribute to the story, or else what's the point? So in Out of the Silent Planet, Ransom uh, becomes martial. He participates in the, in the hunt for the, the Hanakra, the monster that lives in the water. We're told that something in the air Ransom now breathed was making him strengthen and become a man, a hunter. We're told that he's frightened before this hunt, but the hunt was necessary, and the necessary was always possible. His participation in this hunt gives him a newfound manhood, we're told, and when he turns out to be the slayer of the monster, uh, we're told that he had grown up 
before leaving this story, let's just notice one other uh, recurrent image throughout the book, and that is the tree. You may recall, if you've read Out of the Silent Planet, how there are ancient woods that have now been turned to stone. Uh, one of the races that live on Ma in Malacandra live in the forest lowlands. Another race lives surrounded by forests, I mentioned many, many times throughout the story. Uh, a, a third race is likened to trees. Ransom comes across such trees as man had never seen, and so on and so forth. And all these references to trees are not accidental. They are part and parcel of the planet's presiding deity, because Mars was not always and only the god of war. Originally, in Roman mythology, he was a vegetation deity. He was associated with trees and forests. He was known as Mars Silvanus. In one of Lewis's books, he mentions the twins whom Rhea Silvia bore to Mars and who were suckled by a wolf. Mars was the springtime divinity, the, the month of March. It's called March because it's sacred to Mars in this capacity, because it's in the third month of the year that the trees come back to life after winter, but also the months in which kings would march off to war with the weather becoming better after winter. And Lewis would have known all this from uh, Cato the Elder and from Fraser's Golden Bough and other sources. I just want to say one other thing about the Cosmic Trilogy, not actually about Out of the Silent Planet, but the third volume, That, that Hideous Strength. Because as you recall, if you've read that, that Hideous Strength, in that volume of the trilogy, the planetary characters actually come down to Earth at the end of the story to bring about the, the denouement of the whole trilogy. And so the spirit of Malacandra, the spirit of Mars, actually descends uh, at the end of the third book. And uh, here's a portion of the description that Lewis gives. Something tonic and lusty and cheerily cold like a sea breeze was coming over them. That is to say, over Ransom and Merlin. There was no fear anywhere. The blood inside them flowed as if to a marching song. They felt themselves taking their places in the ordered rhythm of the universe, side by side with punctual seasons and patterned atoms and the obeying seraphim. Under the immense weight of their obedience, their wills stood up straight and untiring like caryatids. Eased of all fickleness and all protestings, they stood, gay, light, nimble, and alert. They had outlived all anxieties. Care was a word without meaning. To live meant to share in this processional pomp. Ransom knew, as a man knows when he touches iron, the clear, taut splendor of that celestial spirit which now flashed between them. Vigilant Malacandra, captain of a cold orb whom men call Mars and Mavors and Tear, who put his hand in the wolf mouth. And in this powerful passage, Lewis is attempting to convey, as he puts it in a letter to a friend, the good element in the martial spirit, what he calls the discipline and freedom from anxiety that comes from surrendering to the military chain of command, distinct from what he regarded as the, the brutal and ferocious elements that he found in Holst's musical portrayal of the martial spirit. Just one other last quick thing about that hideous strength, and that is the character Mark, Mark Studdock. He, as his name indicates, has a special connection with Mars. We're told that Mark had never seen war, but he is to be tried in his own personal battle as the story progresses. The villains of the story are determined to bring Mark to that state of subjugation where obedience to the villains is ever after a matter of psychological or even physical necessity. Mark had in childhood imagined himself as a hero and a martyr, and he now realizes he's facing a straight fight and that he will now find out the truth of his childhood fancies. He finds that this prospect after the long series of diplomatic failures that he's gone through was Tonic. Note that word too. So Mark, Mark becomes a martyr, as it were. He witnesses to his newfound faith in Christ when he's asked at one crucial moment to, to trample upon and stamp upon a, a crucifix. And he looks down at the, the, uh, the crucified form of Christ 
thinking hard, we're told, Mark, thinking hard, looks down at this defenseless wooden figure on the crucifix, nailed and helpless, and the object becomes for him a picture of what happens when the straight meets the crooked. And he remains straight. He doesn't join the crooked side. He witnesses to something which he's not quite sure of yet. I mean, he, this is not, an, uh, this is not a, an explicit conversion moment, but it is the moment of truth for Mark. He becomes a true witness to Christ. That is to say, a martyr, a white martyr. He doesn't shed his blood, but he becomes a martyr. And that's an interesting point itself, because in Dante, in the, in the uh, Paradiso, Dante assigns martyrs to the sphere of Mars. Partly, Lewis says, because of the obvious connection that Martyrs usually die a violent death, but also, he says, because of a mistaken philological connection between martyr and martem. So that's enough by way of background. Um, Lewis has brought his Ransom trilogy to its conclusion, but his involvement with things martial was far from over. And in his second Chronicle of Narnia, Prince Caspian he returns to this theme he had first tackled when he was five or six years old, taking the four Pevensey children, as it were, to Mars and back. To Narnia and back, yes, but Narnia as it is imagined through a martial lens. So, Prince Caspian, where are we? It's 22.30. I've got another half an hour. How interesting that uh, an early scene in Prince Caspian uh, involves the planets. Remember how Dr. Cornelius takes the young Caspian up the tower at night and shows them the conjunction of Tava and Alambil. And this conjunction is interpreted by Glenstorm the centaur as betokening some great good for the sad realm of Narnia. The, the stars foretell success if the old Narnians who live in hiding come out of hiding and try to overturn the usurper Miraz. So Prince Caspian is a war story. It's the civil war of Narnia, as Lewis elsewhere describes it. It's, it's the great war of deliverance, as it's described in the, in the timeline of Narnian history. And if you saw the recent film version uh, you will remember how they went to town on the battle scenes. <laughs> they tried to turn Prince Caspian, I think, into, into sort of, um, well, Tolkien for younger viewers. <laughs> um, and it's interesting how the very word martial itself appears more than once in this story, but never again in any of the other Narnia books. You remember how uh, Reapercheep is described as a, as a gay and martial mouse. Gay, knight, lim nimble and alert, rather like what uh, effect Malacandra has as he comes down at the end of the Ransom Trilogy. Miraz, the usurper, frets over his martial policy. And in a bit of a pun, a, might, you might say a mistaken philological connection, we have the marshals of the lists. You remember the bulgy bears, whose hereditary right it is to be the marshals. But this is martial in the sense of those who have a responsibility for governing mares, horses. It was originally a term in, in horsemanship, martial. It had no uh, explicit connection to the, to the planet Mars. So it's a war story. It's a martial story. And let's quickly trot through some of the, uh, the more obvious militaristic uh, happenings in the story. The children rediscover their their, their armor, don't they, in the, in the treasury, the, the armory of, of, uh, the, of the ruined care parable. Trumpkin is uh, taken to his death by two Telmarine soldiers, but rescued by the four Pevenses as they, as they see him struggling in the boat. And once Trumpkin is rescued, he is put to two tests, a swordsmanship test here with Edmund and also an archery test with Susan. Prince Caspian, having escaped from the castle of his uncle, uh, is found by the old Narnians who live in hiding. And as I've already mentioned, Glenstorm the centaur says that he ought to call a council of war 
So here he is at the council. And they do indeed begin to rise up. The rebellion commences. And uh, they skirmish with the occupying forces of Narnia. And the Pevensey children with, with Trumpkin get involved. Here they are uh, under attack the, in the fir wood. And another notable moment of, uh, of combat is in, the, uh, in Aslan's How, where Caspian here is being attacked by a, a werewolf, a man just turning into a werewolf. And the, the hag uh, gets beheaded, and Nickerbrick gets killed. Um, and that leads to the single combat, the monomachy, as, we're, as it is described, between Peter and Miraz. And there's an interesting thing about this picture. It's not just the single combat in the foreground. It's not just the marshals of the lists. It's the trees in the background. You see those trees, the gathering dryads and hammer dryads and... How interesting that in this book, the tree spirits are also called sylvans. Only in this book are the tree spirits ever called sylvans. This is Lewis glancing at the other aspect of the martial symbolism, Mars Sylvanus, the god of trees and forests. Because it's not just a military story, it's not just a war story, Prince Caspian, it is also a tree story, an arboreal adventure. It's marvelous how um, this cover by Pauline Baines shows us both capacities of Mars at once. We have Caspian on his horse, Destria, the horse is named. Destria is a, you'll find that in the Oxford English Dictionary. It's a word meaning a war horse, a charger. But he's running through the forests and he's just about to be knocked off his horse by that falling tree. Because trees are everywhere in this story. Mars was not always and only the god of war. He was originally a vegetation deity. And look at this image from Pompeii. If you doubt what I'm saying, here's a, a, picture, a picture showing Mars in both capacities at once. Yes, he's the god of war with his shield and his spear and his helmet, but he's standing against a backdrop of burgeoning vegetation. Hence, all the trees in Narnia in this particular story. You remember when the children are first deposited in Narnia, they find themselves in a, in a woody place. They can hardly get out for, for all the, the branches and twigs that are poking into them. They find Narnia has been overgrown by, by trees and ivy. We're told that the Telmarines are frightened of the forests. Lucy tries to wake the trees twice. The first time she fails. But the second time, when Aslan is present, the trees do indeed begin to dance. And later on in the story, there's a positive romp, a Bacchanalian romp. Bacchus and Silenus come along. We've already heard about Pomona, the goddess of fruit trees and orchards. Lewis structures Prince Caspian out of these military elements and these arboreal elements because the whole book is designed to communicate the spirit of Mars. It is a martial story, and if we want to understand the messages that it conveys, the logos, we need to understand the poema. So here are a few thoughts about what Prince Caspian communicates in terms of a, of a spiritual or religious or Christian message. And perhaps the most obvious message conveyed by the means of this martial poema is what Lewis communicates explicitly in Mere Christianity, where he says that the idea of the knight, the Christian in arms for the defense of a good cause, is one of the great Christian ideas. Writing in the aftermath of a war that had threatened his country with Nazi rule, Lewis had obvious reason to champion this tradition of gallantry. In Prince Caspian, he's attempting to acquaint us and indeed delight us with what it feels like to live inside that chivalric tradition. 
instead of stripping the knight of his armor, as he says elsewhere, you can try to put the knight's armor on yourself. He's attempting to provide his audience, his readers, with imaginative access to the discipline and freedom from anxiety that arise out of participation in the martial spirit. Deliverance by means of war is apparently an unavoidable necessity. Peaceful protest isn't going to get them anywhere. Narnia has degenerated into a tyranny under mirrors. Necessity, yes. Cold and strong, necessity's son. Lewis's wartime experience, an odious necessity. But elsewhere he says, interestingly, interestingly, that necessity was always the tyrant's plea. Necessity is the tyrant's plea. They're quoting Milton, I think. But the same sentiment is found in Livy and Cromwell and Pitt, who observed that the claim of necessity could always be used by politicians to excuse any kind of behavior, however brutal and cruel. It's a, it's a reason of state. So knowing this, how did Lewis hope to make out that the necessity of his war of deliverance could be anything other than a tyrannical evil itself? Abusus non tollet usum. That was a Latin tag Lewis liked. Abusus non tollet usum. Abuse does not abolish use. Just because tyrants falsely claim occasionally that necessity will excuse their, their cruelty and brutality, doesn't mean that there is never any such thing as a just war. For Lewis, as for St. Augustine, whose thoughts on the just war he quotes in a letter to a correspondent, the weapons of war could sometimes be legitimately wielded if real and honest necessity arose. But how to characterize real necessity? Lewis wishes to call it the necessity of chivalry. That's the title of an essay that he wrote in the dark days of August of, of 1940, when Britain was under imminent threat of invasion. He writes this article, The Necessity of Chivalry, in which he says that if we're to avoid tyranny, if we're to avoid being invaded by the Nazis, we must have chivalrous soldiers who, like Theseus in the Knight's Tale, in Chaucer's Knight's Tale, know how to make a virtue of necessity. That phrase you may often use, making a virtue of necessity, that comes from Chaucer's Knight's Tale. And in this article, The Necessity of Chivalry, Lewis repeats how important it is that the knightly ideal in the Middle Ages brought together two things that have no natural tendency to gravitate towards one another. The knight, he says, is a man of blood and iron, but also a gentle, modest, unobtrusive man. The knight is fierce to the nth degree, but also meek to the nth degree. He combines both characters. And to Lewis, this knightly ideal wasn't, wasn't an outdated curio, but a living reality, practical and vital, as he puts it in this article. He was no less admiring of it in his adulthood than he had been as a boy when he first was acquainted with Chaucer's tale. Some of Lewis's contemporaries, the Royal Air Force pilots, to whom we owe our life from hour to hour, he says, these were modern equivalents of the medieval knight. And their successors must be bred up if we are to escape from a world, as he puts it, divided between wolves who do not understand and sheep who cannot defend the things which make life desirable. So martial hardness is not, to be, is not to be confused with heartlessness. Hardness is a key martial term, by the way. The hard virtue of Mars, as he puts it in a poem. The sturdy hardiness of Mars, as he describes it in the discarded image. The hard and happy Mars, as he puts it in his planet's poem. Martial hardness is that strength, which on the one hand gives backbone to the milksop, and on the other hand, reigns in machismo so that it doesn't become cruel. It may be violent, but violence is not necessarily cruelty. Within these two extremes, war service, if it is truly necessary, may be entered into, as he puts it in mere Christianity, with a kind of gaiety and wholeheartedness. Gaiety, again, note that term, 
It's this unashamed wholeheartedness that may explain why some critics think they've found in Narnia a glorification of conflict and retribution, a legitimizing of cruelty. Lewis thought that there was a place for duly retributive justice and for a just war. And indeed, he went on the offensive in one place. He, he, he addressed the Oxford Pacifist Society in 1940 under the title, Why I Am Not a Pacifist. The brave knight, the chivalrous knight, who risks life and limb for the sake of the oppressed, richly deserves to be honored. And if this honor happens to be easily corrupted by propagandizing politicians, so what? Abuse does not abolish use. But Lewis would have, would, have, would have rebutted with vigor this allegation that Narnia shows something that is glorifying in and legitimizing cruelty. Chivalry imposes restraints on the practice of war so as to avoid anything which is unnecessary. And Prince Caspian memorably depicts that. Remember, the hag and the werewolf, they are willing to, to do anything. Nickerbrick will employ the hag and the werewolf to, do, to get his war aims however wickedly and, and improperly. That kind of unrestrained warring spirit Lewis regarded as unacceptable. And he tries to restrain a kind of jingoistic tone in other places too. Peter, in the single combat, we're told, is, is fearful. We, he doesn't just go to it without a, without a second thought. Edmund, remember, gets all choked up when he thinks that Peter might die in this single combat. There's no glorifying over, there's no gloating over the, over the victims of the hag and the werewolf. They, Peter, remember, averts his eyes from the corpses of his enemies. And he determines to honor even the traitor Nickerbrick with appropriate burial. Lewis divided poets of war into, into three classes, the enchanted, the disenchanted, and the re-enchanted. The enchanted include Sidney, Sir Philip Sidney, Macaulay, Chesterton, Rupert Brooke. The disenchanted are meant to include Siegfried Sassoon, and though Lewis doesn't mention him, uh, Wilfred Owen. And the re-enchanted are those such as Homer, the Malden poet, and I think Lewis means to include himself too, amongst the re-enchanted. He says, one is not in the least deceived about war. He knew war, he'd, he'd served in the, in the French trenches. One is not in the least deceived. We remember the trenches too well. We know how much of the reality, the romantic view left out, but we also know that heroism is a real thing. So he aims to strike a balance between propaganda on the one hand and protest on the other. No doubt chivalry is a failure, he says. No doubt chivalry is a failure, but it is not such a failure as pacifism. Wars, even just wars, inevitably involve evil, but not so much evil as is involved in passively allowing aggressors to have their way. For evil to triumph, it is only necessary that good men do nothing. And so in his book on the 16th century, he sums up these views by stating, we have discovered that the scheme of outlawing war has made war more like an outlaw without making it less frequent. And that to banish the knight does not alleviate the suffering of the peasant. The plight of the suffering peasantry in Narnia, that is to say the old Narnians who live in hiding, is alleviated. It's alleviated by Aslan's great thundering war cry in chapter 11. Aslan, we're told, who seemed larger than before, lifted his head, shook, shook his mane, and roared. This is a key moment in the story, and here's the relevant paragraph. The sound Deep and throbbing at first, like an organ beginning on a low note, rose and became louder, and then far louder again until the earth and air were shaking with it. It rose up from that hill and floated across all Narnia, down in Miraz's camp. Men woke, stared palely in one another's faces and grasped their weapons. Down below that, in the great river, now at its coldest hour, the heads and shoulders of the nymphs and the great weedy bearded head of the river god rose from the water, 
Beyond it, in every field and wood, the alert ears of rabbits rose from their holes, the sleepy heads of birds came out from under wings, owls hooted, vixens barked, hedgehogs grunted, the trees stirred. This is the most militaristic moment in Aslan's role in the story. He's clearly the commander in chief. He requires Lucy's absolute obedience. He takes the boy's salute. He instructs Peter to knight Caspian. He is the Narnian Lord of Hosts, mighty in battle. And the children in the story must grow up into that martial spirit. So the boys harden into knights. Caspian, sleeping under the stars at night, begins to harden. All Edmund's battles come back to him. The magic in the air of Narnia has saved Susan's bowstring from perishing. Everything is prepared for them to live into this new martial reality, if only they will obey. But it's a frightening demand that Aslan makes, especially upon Lucy. Lucy, remember, has to witness to the other, others in her party even though she's the youngest, she has to go and wake them up in the middle of the night and tell them that they've been going in the wrong direction and that they must follow her. And if they won't follow her, she'll go alone. This is the moment of truth for Lucy Pevensey. It is a terrible thing to have to wake four people all older than yourself and all very tired for the purpose of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. I mustn't think about it. I must just do it thought Lucy. And that's the turning point in the story. Lucy does her duty. She becomes a true soldier. It's not just for the boys. She does her duty witnessing to what she's seen and she turns the company about so that eventually even Susan can receive the martial spirit. Susan, you remember, has been very reluctant to see Aslan, even though she knows he's really there. But she gradually becomes more susceptible to the martial spirit, taking Mars's weight of obedience on her shoulders, as it were. You have listened to fears, child, said, As said Aslan. Come, let me breathe on you. Forget them. Are you brave again? A little, Aslan, said Susan. And in addition to this militaristic aspect, the trees also begin to participate more and more in the spirit of Aslan. Pale birch girls were tossing their heads. Willow women pushed back their hair from their brooding faces to gaze on Aslan. The queenly beeches stood still and adored him. Shaggy oak men, lean and melancholy elms, shock-headed hollies and great gay rowans all bowed and rose again, shouting Aslan, Aslan, in their various husky or creaking or wave-like voices. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Aslan is the true Mars, according to that technique of transferred classicism, by means of which pagan gods could serve very well for Christian purposes. And the children grow up into that spirit because that spirit surrounds them in every part of Narnia, not just located in the Christ character, but located in the whole Narnian universe as it is depicted in this story. For God is not far from each one of us. In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. The boys harden into the nights, the girls romp in the bacchanalian revelry with the swaying trees and the growing vines, and even seemingly unimportant little details like the discovery of the chess piece in the ruins of Ker Paravel at the start of the story. Even they contribute to the total effect. Of course, it, it has to be a chess knight, doesn't it? It couldn't be a chess pawn or a chess king or a chess bishop. Because everything in this story is conspiring to generate the appropriate martial atmosphere. In his single combat with Miraz, we're told that, that Peter is not making sufficient use of his shield. Lewis there, I think, is glancing at the shield of faith in Ephesians 6, by means of which the Christian may turn to flight the armies of the aliens. 
Lewis refers to those scriptural sources in his discussion of Spencer's Night of Faith. Faithful obedience is the chief virtue that Aslan imparts to his followers under the aegis of Mars in this story. It's a virtue of which George MacDonald had written in a passage which Lewis anthologized. Do you ask what is faith in him, in God? I answer, says George MacDonald, the leaving of your own way is faith in him, your objects, yourself, and the taking of his and him and doing as he tells you. I can find no words strong enough, MacDonald says, to serve the weight of this necessity, this obedience. Discipline, faithfulness, obedience, strength, growth. It's this spectrum of qualities that becomes available to those characters who are properly disposed to the martial influence, to the Christological influence that is shed upon them in this story. These characters steadily and increasingly enjoy the martial influence that Aslan, both incarnate and discarnate, sheds abroad in this tale. Mars, we might even say, channeling St. Paul, is the unknown god of Prince Caspian who surrounds and upholds Lucy and the others, forging them into warriors or woodlanders or witnesses or a mixture of all three. As the Apostle Paul had once stood on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and proclaimed to the men of Athens the person of Jesus Christ, in whom we live and move and have our being, so in the second chronicle of Narnia, a very similar thing is done by C.S. Lewis. Thank you very much. <laughs>